Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of the Yeag Letters by William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. So it's actually about Yahe, which is also um, called Ayahuasca, a psychedelic drug. But because Burroughs didn't put an uh, accent over the E in Yahe, it's pronounced Yeag. Um, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say for me that by far the most interesting thing in this was the introduction. Dane reads... Okay, so William Burroughs closed his classic debut novel, Junkie, by saying he had determined to search out a drug he called Yeg, which he believed transmitted telepathic powers, a drug that could be the final fix. In the Yeg letters, a mix of travel writing, satire, psychedelia and epistolary novel, he journeys through South America, writing to his friend Allen Ginsberg about his experiments with a strange drug, and using it to travel through time and space and derange his senses, the perfect drug for the author of the wild, decented books and cut-ups that followed. Years later, Ginsberg Ginsberg writes back as he follows in Burroughs' footsteps and finds the drug more terrible and profound than he had imagined. So let's go through and check out some tabs. We're going to start with the introduction by Oliver Harris, which honestly I think was probably my favourite part of the book. It's certainly the bit that I found the most interesting. So first off a note on the pronunciation here, it says, The mystery of the vine of the soul can wait, but its very name poses an immediate conundrum. Burroughs wrote the word Yeg as if it rhymed with age, but it was properly written Yahe and pronounced as Burroughs knew Yahe. Why not simply correct the spelling? After all, the error gives the impression of a kind of willed ignorance, less a personal idiosyncrasy than a mistranslation that disrespects the language of the drug's indigenous culture, in effect, an act of colonial appropriation. And yet to fix the problem now and change the book's very title would be to resolve a lack of fixity and ambiguous duplicity that has always been a part of the text and reader's experience of it. Because of this ongoing confusion, rather than despite it, I reserve Yeage for the Yeage letters and use Yahe in all of the contexts. This fits my aim to respect the historical text, but it was an awkward decision and I was relieved when a fellow editor confirmed my sense that it's the appropriate one. I think you should stick with your argument about the title. As an ignorant reader, I wasn't sure how to pronounce it, it's part of the mystery. I actually say Yeg to rhyme with vague rather than Yeg to rhyme with age. Either way, it's not a real word. Yahe is. Yeg or Yeg isn't. So we learn here a little bit about the context in which um, the Yeg letters was, was published. In the larger picture, 1963 was also the year that City Lights published Miserable Miracle, the translation of Henri Michaud's experiences of mescaline, that Timothy Leary and Richard Alper were sacked by Harvard for their LSD experiments, and that Aldous Huxley died in the last week of November as Burroughs' book rolled off the presses. Six months later, Ken Casey and his merry pranksters took their bus on the road, launching their acid tests and announcing the arrival of the psychedelic youth counterculture. Of course, this was no unified movement. Burroughs didn't get on with Leary any more than Schultes did, dashing Ginsburg's optimism that Bill and Leary at Harvard are going to start a beautiful consciousness alteration of the whole world. In fact, with this typically prescient paranoia motivated by bad trips on LSD and DMT, Burroughs cautioned against psychedelics. They are poisoning and monopolising the hallucinogen drugs, he warns in Nova Express. Nevertheless, there can be little doubt, observes Schultes, that the second half of the 20th century will be remembered as a time when mind-altering or hallucinogenic substances came into increasing use, serious as well as frivolous, in sophisticated Western societies. In 1963, the US was ready to be Yahi conscious, and Ralph Metzner rightly observes that the shamanic law of ayahuasca entered most strongly into Western culture initially through the Yeg letters. Then again, as Schultes and Metzner acknowledge, what was new in the West had been sacred and medicinal custom for millennia in the New World tropics. By the way, uh, the day that Aldous Huxley died, I believe, was um, 11-22-63, the day that Kennedy got shot, um, and it was also the day that C.S. Lewis died. So here we find out how, despite the fact that it's presented as letters, uh, it didn't actually start out like that, and um, we have some statistics here. Um, to put it in terms of crude statistics, of this 9,500 word manuscript, which is a sort of first person travelogue journal, only 320 words definitely came from real letters. And to put this into perspective, 85% of this manuscript was used for In Search of Yeg, and made up 80% of its first six letters, January 15 to April 15. These six letters in turn make up 75% of the whole section. As for the last six, May 5 to July 10, assembled after the June manuscript, just over a thousand words, about a quarter, came from real letters, while about half came from notes from his travel diaries typed out into letters and meant for insertion. 
and we learn a bit more about his construction. Uh, apart from the March the 3rd letter, none of which appeared in his June manuscript, Burroughs fabricated its epistolary appearance by adding materials such as the letter's formal tops and tails, by changing the tense to create an improvised effect of reporting live, and by cutting out telltale lines. While some letters were created only by adding the formal openings and endings, such as January 25th, in other cases, such as February 28th, Burroughs adapted the first and last paragraphs of real letters to use as frames for material in his non-epistory manuscript. Other letters were more complex composites of the original manuscript, inserted notebook entries, new material, and selections from multiple real letters. Some more, again, information on how it ended up getting published. If the manuscript history of In Search of Yeager during 1953 was unexpectedly complicated, piecing together its evolution over the next decade shows the road to publication was no less so. Burroughs' plans for it first appear in September 1954, prompted by Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perception. Since Huxley's book on peyote seems to have attracted attention, perhaps we could do something with the Yeag material, he suggests to Ginsburg. Ginsburg must have encouraged Burroughs because, by the end of December, he was now thinking of two separate projects, the SA Letters, and a short book just on Yeag like Huxley's peyote book, positively no schoolboy smut. Well, it did end up with schoolboy smut in it anyway, but that's, Gins uh, that's Burroughs for you. In a letter that Ginsburg wrote to Kerouac, it's quite interesting, we get His letter also refers to a brand new publishing venture, Crazy Lights, which he had heard was stillborn. Fortunately, Ginsburg's report of the demise of City Lights was premature, and obviously City Lights went on to become a hugely influential poetry publisher. Um, so that's it from what I tabbed out in the introduction. We'll head into the main novel now. So these are from some of Burroughs' uh, writing. So interesting here, um, he talks about this bug, and this is kind of the... Um, a, a, an important part of the plot of a Roald Dahl novel called My Uncle Oswald. Um, I, I think that was which novel it was. Um, but anyway, the plot of this novel by Roald Dahl that was written for adults and not for kids um, was that these people were going and giving um, like well-known writers aphrodisiacs to get to get them to have sex, to get DNA samples basically, to get sperm samples that they could then sell to people. Anyway, um, so Boris says. Um, I sent some to Berlin. They made tests and reported the effect is identical to the effect of hashish. There is a bug in the putty mayo, I forget what they call it, like a big grasshopper. Such a powerful aphrodisiac. If it flies on you and you can't get a woman right away, you will die. I have seen them running around jacking off from contact with this animal. I have one in alcohol around some place. No, come to think of it, it was lost when I moved here after the war. Another thing I have been trying to get information on it, a vine you chew and all your teeth fall out. And Burroughs replies, just the thing for practical jokes on your friends. Wow, what a practical joker. So uh, he talks here about his first time trying Yahe, he says I sat there waiting for results and almost immediately had the impulse to say that wasn't enough, I need more. I have noticed this inexplicable impulse on the two occasions when I got an overdose of junk. Both times before the shot took effect I said that wasn't enough, I need more. He says he's been reduced to the shoddy expedient of stealing his drinking alcohol from the university laboratory placed at the disposal of the visiting scientist. He says every night I go into a cafe and order a bottle of Pepsi Cola and pour in my lab alcohol. And he talks about um... Orca, a tribe of hostile Indians, he says. On the boat, I talk to a man who knows the Ecuador jungle like his own prick. It seems jungle traders periodically raid the Orca, a tribe of hostile Indians. Shell lost about 20 employees to the Orca in two years. And carry off women they keep penned up for the purposes of sex. Sounds interesting. Maybe I could capture an Orca boy. I have precise instructions for orca raiding. It's quite simple. You cover both exits of orca house and shoot everybody you don't want to fuck. He says uh, somebody stole a, a watch of his. He says the watch didn't run. I never had one that did. All right, so he was talking about, I mean, obviously he was a, he was a heroin addict and a homosexual, so uh, he wasn't particularly popular in 1950s America, but he says, South America does not force people to be deviants. You can be queer or a drug addict and still maintain position, especially if you're educated and well-mannered. There is deep respect here for education. In the US, you have to be a deviant or exist in dreary boredom. Even a man like Oppenheimer is a deviant, tolerated for his usefulness. Make no mistake, all intellectuals are deviants in the US. Then we have this short bit called uh, Roosevelt After Inauguration, which is quite interesting. The thing, uh, the one line in this which I quite, <laughs> quite enjoyed, it's very Burroughs. Best thing for piles is a baboon's prick up the ass, right Harry? And he writes here, Then Roosevelt gave himself over to such vile and unrestrained conduct as is shameful to speak of. He instituted a series of contests designed to promulgate the lowest acts and instincts of which the human species is capable. There was a most unsavoury act contest, a cheapest trick contest, molest a child week, turn in your best friend week, professional stool pigeons disqualified, and the coveted title of all around vilest man of the year. 
Sample entries. The junkie who stole an opium suppository out of his grandmother's ass. The ship captain who put on women's clothes and rushed into the first lifeboat. The vice squad cop who framed people for indecent exposure, planting an artificial prick in their fly. He mentions here, uh, did you ever read H.G. Wells' The Country of the Blind? About a man stuck in a country where all the other inhabitants had been blind so many generations they had lost the concept of sight. He flips, but don't you understand? I can see. That sounds good. I haven't read that, but I do want to read that now. This is a very good point. He says, people think all they have to do is go in some shady business and they'll get rich overnight. They don't realise that business, shady or legitimate, is the same fucking headache. And he talks about a young Dane, and I just enjoy this because, obviously, because of my name. He's talking about someone from Denmark, but still. Met a young Dane and took Yahe with him. He immediately vomited it up and avoided me after that. He evidently thought I tried to poison him, and he was saved only by the prompt reaction of his hygienic Scandinavian gut. I never knew a Dane that wasn't bone dull. Yeah, but he never knew me. All right, so we're moving on to the letters that Ginsburg wrote to Burroughs, and his have got some pretty cool uh, illustrations. Uh, I actually thought that would make a good T-shirt. We've got some poetry and stuff as well. Great line um, in a letter that Burroughs writes to Ginsburg. He says, no one in his senses would trust the universe. And then we get some uh, appendices, which have got some really interesting stuff. Mostly, um, you can kind of see some bits of source material and how the manuscript developed, you know. He says, the putamayo dose is about one gram of yahina, or half the lethal dose for the average adult. Half the lethal dose of any drug doesn't leave much margin for individual susceptibility. Uh, and he writes, I cannot say whether Yahe increases the telepathic faculties. Everyone white and Indian in the area firmly believes this. So there we were, they say, high on Yahe lying around in a telepathic state. Any drug used in common with others conveys mutual empathy. I don't have to ask someone or speak his language to know when he is junk sick and exactly how it feels. And uh, then the final thing I wanted to note here, he, he notes that nutmeg... Uh, nutmeg is sometimes used by convicts desperate for kicks. About a tablespoon is swallowed with water. Results are somewhat similar to marijuana, but headache and nausea are usual side effect. As one nutmeg user expressed it, man, it's really a rough route. And I remember trying that at school. I didn't get a buzz out of it or anything, but yes. It was kind of common knowledge at my school, the idea that you could take nutmeg and it would get you high. It didn't really do anything. Anyway, William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, the Yahe letters. Um, Really fascinating. As I, as I say, the introduction to it was the most interesting part for me, but um, if you're a Burroughs fan or a Ginsberg fan, you have to read this. If you're interested in the psychedelic literature, Beat Generation stuff, you have to read this. Um, it does feel incomplete, but that's kind of the nature of it. Again, get a version with a decent introduction that kind of covers the history of the manuscript. It's, it's kind of ever-evolving. They're even saying there's bits of it that got lost. Um, that should they ever turn up in a collection somewhere will then be added to it So the, this version isn't necessarily the final version, you know, but all in all I gave it probably like a week four out of five yeah. So there we have it. That's what I made of the Yeg letters by William S. Burroughs and Alan Ginsberg As always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button If you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot Bye-bye Thank you Google